Hey guys, how you doing? I hope you had a lovely week. Uh, I had a fantastic week. It's been a cold week, uh, but I'm doing good. Today, I'd like to share with you my best 10 open source projects. These are projects that I've come across in my daily reading and in my line of work. And I feel like I'd, I'd like to share them with you. They're really interesting, spanning multiple sectors from cybersecurity to machine learning to deep learning. I'm not going to have an in-depth uh, overview on what they do. I'm not going to go deep down in how they work and what you need to do to get them up and running. I'm trying to keep this video as brief as possible. Definitely in the future, we'll cover one or two on how you can apply them in real projects, in real life scenarios. So let's begin. Best 10 open source projects for 2019-2020. Starting at number 10, we have Dopamine by Google. Dopamine tries to tackle an interesting area in reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, for those who don't know, is a subset of artificial intelligence. Now in AI, we have a lot of categories uh, from deep learning to machine learning. Reinforcement learning is one of those categories and reinforcement learning, what it does is that it tries to mimic how the human brain thinks. It tries to mimic uh, human thinking and essentially tries to mimic how neurons in the human mind work. Reinforcement learning is how we learn new things in our lives. It's how we learn how to perform day-to-day -day tasks and how we get to learn lessons in life. You know, tasks like walking, you know, tasks like um, tying your shoes. Simple lessons like, you know, t touching something hot is going to result in you getting burnt. So how we learn these things is that there's no starting point data. We don't know what is truth and what is lies. We don't know what is false and what is correct. So we have to interact with the data and we have to react to what we learn. And that's what reinforcement learning is. So, for example, a child doesn't know if something is hot and if you touch it, you're going to get burned. So when that child touches that hot thing, they're going to get burned. And now next time they're not going to touch it because they've learned that it's something hot. Uh, basically, that's how reinforcement learning is. There's no starting point data. We're starting from a raw, fresh canvas. And as we interact with the world, we learn what we're supposed to do to achieve the particular tasks uh, that we want. That's the basic definition of reinforcement learning. Normally, researchers have to assume a lot of things as they are building reinforcement learning algorithms. So dopamine gives you a library whereby there are a lot of assumptions already uh, written. Uh, you don't have to write a lot of things from scratch. It essentially gives you a flexible development experience when creating reinforcement learning algorithms. So if you're into reinforcement learning, definitely check out dopamine. I think it's going to be a cool arsenal in your toolkit. At number nine, we have Spectrum by Facebook. Spectrum is a new open source mobile image production tool. Facebook is one of the largest social media giants we have. Uh, they have over a billion users and these users, they're constantly sharing images. So Facebook has to find a way in which they can retain the quality of these images. Certain day-to-day -day tasks like compression, image rotation can result in images losing quality. So what Spectrum does is that it allows these images to maintain loss lossless compression as users are performing these tasks. And this is really essential because users want to enjoy high quality images from their social networks. So when and where would you need to use Facebook Spectrum? If you're building an app whereby users are going to share images or images are going to be shared quite a lot, uh, definitely take a look at Spectrum. It's going to help you in maintaining the lossless nature of your images as you compress them. You're going to have to compress them so that you can save you know, storage space. Also, if you're doing a lot of image classification in machine learning, if you're using a tool like OpenCV uh, to do certain tasks like OCR, Open Character Recognition and other image classification tasks, definitely take a look at Spectrum. At number eight, we have Flimscope by Netflix. Flimscope is essentially a visualization tool that allows Netflix to visualize interaction and input data that's happening on the Netflix app. Netflix has essentially abstracted that data as flame graphs. A flame graph is essentially an abstraction of a time series on that input and interaction data. And what the Netflix does is that they apply a heat map on these flame graphs. And with that heat map, they can tell, you know, what are the bottlenecks? What are the hot points that need to be optimized? Because remember, Netflix is operating on a global scale. There's a lot happening both at the back end where Netflix app is running and also on the device where the app itself is running. So Netflix needs to know what are the bottlenecks, what are the constraints, so that they can make sure that the Netflix app gives the users a good user experience. Think of Flimscoop as a tool that you can use to visualize your system and your app interaction and input data as they happen in real time. So if you're building apps that are being used at a massive scale, if optimization is really key for you, if you want to see what the bottlenecks are in terms of the lowest abstraction, in terms of time units, then you can use Flimscope to do that. At number seven, we have Kraken. Kraken is a peer-to-peer -peer Docker registry. A Docker registry is essentially a Docker image 
distributor. Now Kraken is different because it's not a centralized Docker image distributor like Kubernetes, rather it's peer-to-peer. -peer. And this makes sense for Uber because Uber is building applications and microservices that are running on multiple regions, on multiple geographical locations, on multiple web servers. So a centralized model is kind of constraining to them and a peer-to-peer -peer model makes kind of sense. And that's why they had to build a peer-to-peer -peer Docker registry version, a peer-to-peer -peer version of Kubernetes, if I can say that. As you start out, a centralized Docker registry might make sense. But as you scale out, as your application grows and you start operating in cross continents, if you start operating in data centers that are hosted in different regions, you have to think in terms of geographical distribution of your Docker images. And that's where Kraken comes in. When and where would you need to use Kraken? If you're a small startup or a small company, a centralized Docker registry makes sense for you. You can look at Kubernetes or other solutions out there. But once you start scaling, if you see your app is going to scale in the future, then definitely look up Docker in terms of a peer-to-peer -peer version of a Docker registry. That might really save you in the future in terms of scaling bottlenecks. At number seven, we have Vulkanizer. Vulkanizer is a library for Elasticsearch. Essentially, it allows you to manage your Elasticsearch cluster in an easier way. It provides a high-level API for you to do normal day-to-day -day tasks such as configuring Elasticsearch settings, managing your nodes, among other functions. Elasticsearch is a really good search solution if you've had to build search around your applications. For example, personally, I've had to build search around my logs and I've used Elasticsearch among other applications and it really becomes kind of hectic to manage, especially when you have uh, more than one node and if those nodes are running on multiple machines. So this high-level API is really useful in such a scenario and if you find yourself facing such challenges, then definitely look to Vulkanizer and incorporate it in your workflows. At number five, we have Open Sensors by Google. Open Sensors is essentially an instrumentation, telemetry, collector, and analytics solution. It essentially allows you to collect telemetry such as metrics and distributed traces that are happening on your services. What are metrics and what are distributed traces? Metrics is essentially any data that you'd like to track, uh, data such as latency in any service or in any database that you're running, the request length, the response length, how long your files take to open, how long your database takes to open. These are metrics that you can collect with an instrumentation telemetry provider. Traces, on the other hand, are flows in terms of how your services are operating and how they are running. Traces essentially allow you to understand what's happening under the hood, what are the bottlenecks, what are the constraints, and how you can architecture your solution to be much more efficient in terms of how your services operate. So Open Sensors is essentially an open source uh, telemetry solution provider. There are others in the market and they're really expensive. I think big database solution providers, big cloud analytical solution providers like Azure and AWS, they have their own telemetry that you can plug into. But if cost is an issue to you or you'd like to maintain the op an open source nature in terms of your solutions, then definitely look towards open sensors. At number four, we have Pyro. Pyro is a deep universal probabilistic programming library written in Python. It essentially allows you to do Bayesian statistics modeling. There are other tools like SciPy. SciPy is a scientific library built for Python. And what SciPy does is that it allows you to do scientific programming. So Pyro, on the other hand, it allows you to do probabilistic programming in a much more easy, in a much more intuitive way. So if you're doing a lot of Bayesian statistics, if you're a researcher and you're doing a lot of Bayesian modeling and you'd like to automate a majority of your tasks, then look to Pyro. Pyro is going to come in handy in your toolkit. At number three, we have Uber Ludwig. Uber Ludwig is a new interesting area in deep learning and in machine learning in general, where they allow developers to create machine learning solutions using automated processes. Now, typically when you're creating a deep learning solution, you have to module your data, then you have to write the, the deep learning layer, you have to write your neurons, how they work and how they spawn. And then uh, you have to input your data and then you have to test it before now you can spit out our final model. So what auto deep learning does is that it allows developers to automate these middle tedious tasks. So with Uber Ludwig, you can now give it a data source like a .csv file. E.g., let's say you have a solution that predicts the mileage of a car based on the size engine of a car. So the input would be the size engine and then the output label to predict is the mileage of the car. So all you have to do is point it to those features and the middle layer is abstracted for you. You won't even have to create your new roles. 
you won't have to create your your model you won't have to do feature engineering you won't have to do any of that tedious tasks so ludwig is really interesting this is definitely going to catch on uh, and we're going to see a lot of developers use majority of this auto ml and auto deep learning toolkits in their workflows so definitely check this if you're seeking to automate some tedious processes you have in deep learning or machine learning you can use uber ludwig there are a couple of other auto ml tools out there definitely incorporate them in your workflows and uh, tell me how it goes at number two we have tensorwatch by microsoft tensorwatch is an ai debugging and visualization tool if you're a deep learning or a machine learning solutions developer you know that there are two tasks in either that are highly hard to do you cannot easily debug or visualize what's happening inside your deep learning solutions as you run them you don't know how your neural layers are operating how they are working how the data is interacting so what tensorwatch does is that it allows you to visualize and debug uh, how your neurons and how your models and how your algorithms are, are working as deep learning rises and as machine learning gains momentum, there's going to be an increase in model complexity as our data sets get larger. So TensorWatch is going to allow you to see how your training features and how training metrics interact with your application. And, and this is really crucial if you're essentially building really large solutions and you need to see what's going on uh, under the hood. So if you're a deep learning or a machine learning developer, TensorFlow, I think it's a must need for you. It's a must have uh, in your toolkit, in your workflow pipeline. Finally, at number one, we have Ghidra. Ghidra is a software reverse engineering suite of tools developed by NSA. Yes, NSA Research Directorate in support of their cybersecurity missions. What a software reverse engineering suite allows you to do is that it allows you to reverse engineer malware, viruses, or rather apps so that you can see their internals and how they work. Basically, it allows you to debug any application. It doesn't matter whether it's a virus or it's a genuine application. Now, why NSA decided to open source Ghidra, I don't know because there are other open source reverse engineering suite of tools out there. But Ghidra, as it looks, it's really awesome. If you're a pen tester, if you're a forensic expert, if you're a forensic investigator, if you're a reverse engineer, definitely look at Ghidra. It's going to come in handy in your suite of tools. There are not so many open source tools that can really reach this caliber. So definitely give Ghidra a try. That's it for me. I hope you liked this video. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you didn't like it, you know what to do. Hit the subscribe button and the notification icon so that you can be notified when I upload new videos. Till next time, peace.